Dorothea have to hear you clear over in Montana area. So how about if we tell them, good morning, one, two, three. Good morning. Hope you guys are finding some rest in that busy schedule of yours. And we'd like to welcome everybody today. I'm so glad you guys came out on this wonderful, balmy day. I love balm, not really, but um, we live through it. And everybody that's viewing us through the internet, whether it be Facebook or the storehouse.church, we are so grateful that you are here today. You know, the Lord um, put upon my heart uh, in worship. You know, we live in a day and a time that there's so much going around us, and there's so many views, left, right, and center. We're in the end of the end times. We're this, that. There's fear rampant. But you know, if you look back in history, we've always had something building and building and building it, and it is building. I don't know where we're at in the cycle. I do know we are in the end days. But just like David, just like Elijah, just like Moses, and just like Noah. We have to have that faith. We have to open up to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to do that change within us. We have to be that new wineskin for him to pour new wine into. We have to acknowledge that there is no God like Jehovah. Amen? Amen. You want to rise with me, stand, then uh, let's worship. And let's declare today that today is the day that the Lord has made. Amen? Amen. You got to clap with us, too. We're going to require it today. Thank you.
in an old wineskin. We have to, by faith, allow him to come and make a new wineskin in us. We have to be vessels worthy of carrying his love and truth to the nation. So I'm going to ask you to step out today in a greater way and declare to him that you are ready to be that vessel. That you want new ground broken in your life. We want new ground, new ground broken at the storehouse. We declare to decree today new wine, new wineskins, new in the Lord, a new way. Amen.
Good morning. Ooh, ouch. Good morning. Good morning, Americans. <laughs> ah, you're all awake now, huh? Oh, my gracious. That was a good one. Thanks, Chris. I think you got to be toned down now where I can talk normal, huh? <laughs> Lots of times I don't even like to use a microphone. A lot of times I don't need a microphone. Uh, but for the sake of those that are on the web and out there in uh, La La Land, the word about that. Uh, they, the only way they hear me is if I use a microphone, I guess. So uh, that's what I'm told, uh, and I tend to believe it. So uh, we'll just work with that. Anyway, praise God. Pastors Eric and Dorothea are in, well, I think today they might be in Cody, Wyoming. I don't know for sure. I think the conference they're attending starts tomorrow. And so they're going from Cody to Billings, Montana. That's my country. That's good stuff over there. That's God. Not big sky country, as they say, you know. And uh, you can't even understand that until you go there. Really. I mean, you don't even know what big sky is until you go to Montana. Uh, it's, it's just fun stuff. It's, it's a great place. All of God's country is a great place. Amen? Amen. Yeah, good stuff. I'll tell you, I've uh, really appreciated Pastor Eric's series out of the book of Acts. How many of you enjoying that one? Yeah. Oh, man, that's, that's just been, I, I've told Pastor Eric, I said, that's the best series out of the book of Acts I've ever listened to. Yes. And I've heard a lot of preaching out of the book yes. of Acts. Yes. And I can tell you, the, a lot of the difference for me is that before when I've listened to preachers out of the book of Acts, it's always been a lot of theology. You know, uh, and, and there's a lot of theology in there. There is just a lot of good stuff in there. But I'm not a big theological guy. Uh, I, quite frankly, I don't even know how theology works. I'm, I'm just a practical guy. And, and you know what uh, Pastor Eric's been bringing to us is all practicality in, in the book of Acts. It's practical application. And I love the fact we get to the end of the sermon and he goes, this is how to apply it. This is what you need to be about today. And tomorrow and, and this week. This is how the book of Acts is supposed to work. You know, and that's just really, really good stuff. So anyway, about three weeks ago, uh, when the uh, uh, pastor was beginning to, um, I don't know, was that the beginning of the sermon or at the end of the sermon? But he, he almost begged us to come down to the altar and begin to utilize this altar here. And listen, this is not a fancy place. It's, it's not a magical place in any way, shape, or form. But it is a, a place where people come to meet the Lord. And uh, when he was talking to us about that, the Lord uh, spoke to me about preaching today. I, don't, I had just found out, I mean, just prior to that, that I was going to be preaching this day uh, with them being gone. 
And the Lord spoke to me and said, preach out of Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to talk about the uh, faith of um, Daniel. That's a guy in Daniel, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I think he's still there. So, uh, anyway, Daniel chapter 1, 2, and 3. We're going we're gonna to look at mostly Daniel chapter 1. I'll talk about 2 and 3 maybe at the end of the sermon a little bit. But uh, Daniel chapter 1, I know you all brought your Bibles. So... Um, but just in case you didn't, it's going to be up on the screen. Uh, so there you go. So uh, let me see if I can figure out where I'm at in my notes. So to begin with, let's just read Daniel chapter 1. Let's read verses 1 through 16. Okay? And in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged the city, and he overtook it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. That's a whole different sermon. That's a whole sermon by itself right there. Uh, we're not going to get into that one today, though. And he brought the articles into the treasure of the house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, good-looking guys, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language in the literature of the Chaldeans. We're going to camp out on that one a little bit right there. So hang on to a lot of that stuff in verse 4, okay? 5. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank and the three years of training for them so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And to them the chief, the eunuchs, gave the names, and he gave to Daniel the name of Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacy. Now hang on to that line too. That's a very important line. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. And now God had brought Daniel into favor and the goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, said, well, I, fear for my, I fear for my life. I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? And then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, said, please, 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 test your servants for ten days, and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm a meat eater. Meat and taters. Come on. Come on. Yeah, I got one amen out of that one. Yeah, a few hands going up now. Yeah, we're a, we're a meat and taters kind of guy. Yeah. You know, I, you know, like. Kenny there, I've been, I've worked with my hands all my life. you got to have meat and taters to work with your hands, don't you, brother? Yeah, yeah. Vegetables just don't carry you very long. Anyway, Daniel was, I, he wasn't really a vegetarian, but yeah, I know it says there. He <laughs> did vegetables. And then he said, let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this matter, and he tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, 
their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. And thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink, and he gave them yuck. <laughs> I am not convinced about Daniel's diet. Okay, let's just leave that out there. I am not at all convinced about Daniel's diet. So now here we have these three, the four guys, Daniel and these three buddies. And whenever I talk about Daniel, just know that, that I'm talking about all four of them, okay? Uh, it's just too much to say all those names. So we're not going to go there. I know in Sunday school, it was always Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, I mean, we learned to say that really fast. You know, but they're not their real names. So it's not right for us to use them. Okay, so anyway, in verse 4 it says that these young men... They were well learned. They were well trained and able to learn. By now, these guys, all four of these guys have memorized the Torah. You know that? But all four of them had memorized the Torah. Five books, the first five books of the Bible, right? Yes. Yeah. You guys got that done too, right? <laughs> Just saying. Okay, so they had memorized uh, the Torah by now, and they've been taught under the best of teachers. They are physically fit and have been tested under rigid testing to know that they are gifted in all wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Their learning is not only included in the, uh, in the Torah, but geography, economics, and politics, and everything a kid needed to learn in school. Then. They had good schools back then, you know. They weren't public school. <laughs> Don't do go there. So these teenagers are, they're just not the kind of teenagers that sit around and play games on their iPhone, okay? So here they are, and they find themselves captives in Babylon. Babylon. Right? Just like today. Okay? But they get to be chosen to serve in the king's palace as slaves, but under pretty good conditions. They are to be privy to the highest levels of government among all the nobles and the dignitaries of the known world. But, as we know and understand, living in enemy territory has its challenges. And we live in that same world under those, really under those same challenges. This is a storyline that we can really identify with. No, Babylon is, is current day Iraq. Uh, and no, we're not living in Iraq. Uh, thank God we're not living under those conditions. But we still live under the same challenges that Daniel faced in that day. Okay? Daniel is clearly a type of Christ who lives in a very secular world under the tremendous influence of a known enemy who demands to control our lives in every way. Yeah. You feel that sometimes? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <coughs> we have an enemy and he is real. And he's always trying to bring you into bondage. He's always trying to put demands on you. And he does it in some of the most cunning ways. It's absolutely unreal. But that's what's going on with Daniel. That's what's going on here with us, uh, even today. Okay, so just as Jesus Christ overcame the world, so Daniel overcomes his enemies and continues to live for his God. This requires a tremendous amount of faith, as well as God's response to said faith. And so I forgot to open up the sermon today by talking about, uh, well, just mentioning the title of my sermon today, it's just Operational Faith. What kind of faith do you need to live every day? Okay, and uh, I, I, I know that uh, we do give that some thought. Uh, we try to calculate faith. We try to uh, understand faith. We've heard a lot of teaching on faith. Uh, it's, it's one of those topics that, that uh, gets thrown around a lot. We, we even want to grow in our faith, you know, and... Uh, we want to know how to grow from, from here to there or beyond there. And uh, faith is just one of those things that I think is 
The more it's taught, the less it's understood. You know what I mean? Now, I'm going to be talking about faith today, and I'm going to put it in a very practical sense. Okay, because I, I, I have to go out there and live in a world just like you do every day. Okay, and, and I have to apply uh, the same issues as you need. Okay, so we see in verse 8 that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now, that's issue number one. What brings a person to that point? Okay, what is it that, that makes a person just decide, I'm not going to be defiled? Okay, we have to do that every day, don't we? We, we really do. If we're going to live a life of faith pleasing the Lord. Of course, the Bible does say it, you know, in all that you're doing. You, you want to please Jesus. You know? That's what life is all about, pleasing the Lord. Okay? In his upbringing and all his learning, he had really bought into God's plan for living and for life to the extent that it was not difficult at all for him to say no to all the luxuries and the gifts that the world had to offer. Okay, so a lot of that really comes out of his upbringing. He was in, he was in a religious school, okay? Like I say, he wasn't in a public school where they had to teach everything and every perspective from everybody that's, that's ever lived on the face of the earth. He was in a religious school, okay? He lived, the, he learned the Word of God. He was taught from the Word of God. You know, and if you have to memorize the Torah, you're going to learn at least a little bit of it. <laughs> right? Yeah, you might be able to quote it uh, without a lot of understanding, but I doubt it. You know, if you're going to be memorizing the Torah, you're going to have to learn what it's all about. Amen? Amen? You know, so with us, when we get into the Word of God, I hope we don't just get in and read for no reason at all. Just, just try to do some kind of duty, because that's not what it's about. You know, I'm, Barb and I are so fortunate now to be retired, you know, and just to have a lot of time to be in the Word. And we take that time now, and we get that time now with, uh, with the Lord in the morning, and, and I love it. I love it because now uh, we have time to just sit and, and talk about it together. We have time to meditate. We have time to study the Word together. And very often the Lord puts me on a track where I'll just start writing notes, you know, and yeah, you you would laugh if you saw our little our little table in front of our easy chairs where we do all this because there's there's about a hundred little yellow stick of notes. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're just stick of notes everywhere, and and there's no rhyme or reason to any of it. But it's it's all those stick of notes representing things that God has just shared with me, Amen. just poured into me, and I go write them down, and 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 when I'm done with them, well, they kind of go on the table there in a the pile, and so. You know, and then I'll walk by, and, and my leg will brush them, and they all fall on the floor, you know. And then I pick them all up and stack them again. And some days I go through and I sort them out, you know, but hey, it's, it's crazy. I just have all these little notes laying around. I have uh, pads of paper that I've written out whole sermons in, and they're just for me. You know, they're not sermons that I'll ever probably ever get to preach, but they're, they're just, they were just for me. You know, and that's the way studying the Word can be for us all. You know, I, I pray you all get time to do that. If you need to get up earlier in the morning to do that, oh, please do it. It's so well worth the time. You know, you, you have to purpose to do stuff like that. You really do. <clears throat> the warm app. Now today, we don't think twice about eating pork or shrimp or any of that kind of stuff. It's no longer about the legalities of a lifestyle. The Apostle Paul stated to us that we are free to eat about anything we want, right? However, it, the question now is, is it good for us? That's now the defining issue. And we all get to decide that. Is it good for us? You know, um, uh, Barb and I have been to the, the post time down here on 1792 a bunch of times. Man, do they have good shrimp. Oh, half a pound of shrimp, $10. Ooh, I'm I'm telling you, I, I like shrimp. I like their shrimp. I, apparently, it's cooked in, in Old Bay or something like that. I don't know. That's what my wife tells me. That's what uh, gives it some flavor. Oh, yeah. Uh, maybe it's not so much about what we eat. Is it about what we consume or even what consumes us? And some of you traveling out on 1792, you go past a little aviation school 
Uh, it's on the east side of the road, I think. That's sign out front. Um, and for the longest time, I, I, for the entire time we've been here, that sign read such. It said, whatever consumes your mind consumes you. Yeah, how convicting is that? And that's a secular sign. I mean, that's a secular entity putting something out there that actually makes sense even to people that are not Christians. Go figure, huh? It was convicting for me, you know? Whatever consumes your mind consumes you. Ah, it's good stuff. Daniel was not exempt from the temptations in his captivity. And we certainly are not exempt from any in our day, are we? Temptations are everywhere. Still, Daniel lived a life, lifestyle of faith in a very secular environment that was as demanding then as ours is now. And we can certainly begin to understand how Daniel lived out his faith and how we can imitate that. Daniel lived a faith born out of his own faithfulness to God who gave him growth in that lifestyle to approach every day. You see, his training and his education in the Word of God had developed within him a faith and a character that would carry him through any circumstances there. And I want you to understand what I'm saying here. I've never, I, I told Mark coming in here today, I said, I've never really heard anybody preach the connection between faith and one's character. But there's a tremendous connection there. Okay? The Bible gives us the book of Daniel. It gives us uh, all that's written here about Daniel because he was a man not only of faith but of very high quality. Very high character. Very integritous. Nobody could find fault within this man or his buddies. Okay? That all came from the Word of God. We want to see that. We're going to see that as we go on through. So the whole introduction of Daniel and his three buddies is a testament to the entirety of their lives uh, to this point. Okay? For sure they were diligent in all their learning, that it could be noted they learned very well and would continue to be great learners, as well as great leaders. That's why they were chosen by Ashpenaz to serve in the king's household, the king's palace. It was discovered early that these were men of integrity, that they were men of tremendous character, that they were able to learn well. And if they learned well in the past, they'll be good learners in the future. These are people that the king knew that he could make an investment in. Now isn't that interesting that the Lord would take somebody like that and begin to use them in a very secular world? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Diligence is important. Character is very important. If you're in business for yourself, as Kenny is and, and Matt, some of you guys, I don't know all of you or what all you do. I know Anthony's uh, in uh, um, HVAC work. You, you just, you know, Willie is, is a roofer, are you Willie? Yeah, yeah. You got to know that character is very important when you're in business. Otherwise, you don't have what they call repeat business. That's very right. Yeah, I built a business in Montpelier, Idaho when I first got my electrical contracting license. And uh, I did some advertising on the radio. I didn't get one phone call from that advertising. Yeah. Not one. But a friend of mine uh, suggested that a friend of theirs call me and see what I could do. And I went and helped him out. I got, got a job. I got my first job. Went to work. Yeah, pretty quick I got a second phone call and then a third phone call. And within six months I was so booked out it was crazy. Yeah, all word of mouth advertising. Why? It requires, it requires character. It requires diligence. It requires integrity. Yeah, it's a very important issue. 
But faith is very dependent upon that character. Yes. Okay? <clears throat> to note these young men were of great character, integrity, trustworthy. They were faithful and totally dependent upon God. No doubt they had been tested numerous times and had discovered that God always displayed the exact same character. See, that comes with walking by faith. Amen? So what does all this have to do with faith? Now we can see that operational faith is born out of one's own character that teaches us to always do right. And in this sense, faith and righteousness are really synonymous. Is that interesting? Have you ever heard that before? Faith and righteousness are really synonymous. What you do every day speaks about who you are. That's right. Amen? Amen? Absolutely. And I'm sure Daniel must have had a little trepidation when he told Ashpenaz that he would not defile himself with the king's food. But did he did what was right. And please note that when he did right, God responded with favor in Daniel's tempter. And this suggests that Daniel had to step out in faith first, and then God could respond to that faith. Now, we'll stop there a minute, and if you read through Daniel 1, 2, and 3, which is, is all about the early years of Daniel's life under Nebuchadnezzar. You find out that Daniel always stepped out in faith first, and God always responded. Sometimes we expect God to do something first so that we can respond to him. And sometimes he does. Sometimes he does do that. Sometimes we are called to respond to him. But generally... Operational faith requires you to act first, which opens the doors for God to respond in oftentimes very miraculous ways. Sometimes it's just in a very simple way where you need favor. How many of you ever needed favor with somebody before? Oh my, oh my. Many, many, many times have I needed favor with somebody. You know, and, and you just have to go in faith, you know. But that faith is born out of quality character, okay? And we can see then this first step of faith embolden Daniel to take a second step of faith. And he says to his tempters, go ahead, test me for ten days. I don't remember what verse that's in. There, go backwards to about 13, 14. Can you do that, Mark? 12. 12. 12? So please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now, you know, I'll tell you what. You know, it's his first step of faith, and he found out after he took the stand of saying, I will not be defiled. You know, we live in a day and age right now where the cancel culture, I mean, we talked about this, uh, Mark asked this yesterday at the men's group. How many of you been, know what cancel culture is? How many of you have been confronted by cancel culture uh, already? You know, it, it, is, it is a rising issue in this country. And, and they are coming after us with all kinds of things. Uh, do you... Uh, do you stand with homosexuals? Do you stand uh, for the abortionists? Do you stand with all these, all this different stuff that they are out to push on us? And they're demanding now that we stand with them. Okay? They're going to get in your face. I mean, we're seeing that all, even on the news where, where cancel culture people, I mean, they get right up to you nose to nose and they scream at you. And they demand that you agree with them. They demand that you simply deny your own faith. Deny your own training and, and deny your own character. Deny everything that you stand for with the word of God. And they demand that you agree with them. That's cancel culture. 
And that's what's going on in our country. And I think some of that's even worse today than Daniel ever had to put up with. Man, it's, it's getting really, really ugly out there. Yeah. Um, one of the things that uh, we know is going on, too, that uh, Antifa. Uh, we, we haven't seen much Antifa around here. I haven't anyway. I don't know if they're around or not. But they've been burning churches down. Yeah. Uh, they might just go set churches on fire. No reason. They just hate churches. They hate God. And they hate the people of God. And they go burn churches down to make a statement. We're here to change you. Okay? We're going to have to make a stand. We're going to have to take a stand and say, I will not be defiled. Amen? So Daniel was emboldened by that first step of faith when he got figured out that Ashpenaz now had been touched by the Lord to agree with him. So Ashpenaz now is, is showing signs of going backwards. This is pushing cancel culture away, right? And Daniel's saying, okay, all right. I see now, I, you agree with me, I don't want to be defiled. How are you going to do that? Well, test me for 10 days, okay? I'll eat the vegetables. <laughs> Just say, mm, right. What's those little round things? Brussels green. Oh, nasty. Okay. Well, again, God granted Daniel favor for his tempter. And this brings us to remembrance that great man of faith, our father Abraham. So go to Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. And we know about Abraham. Abraham is, in our minds, and what we're taught, what we're trained to think and understand, is that Abraham was a great man of faith. Yeah? Yeah, and at this point in Genesis chapter 17, he has already walked with the Lord a lot of times, okay? I mean, he's, he's already gone from uh, southeastern Iraq up to northwestern Syria and on his way to Canaan to the promised land, a land that God was going to show him. You know, the, you know a lot of that story, okay? He has walked with the Lord a lot already. And in this process, God is developing a faith in him. A faith that leads him and guides him every day of his life. And so he gets into Genesis chapter 17 here in verse 1. It says, when Abraham was 99 years old. Now, we're not quite there yet. I'm close. 99 years old and the Lord appeared to him. And he said to him, I am almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. Now, why would he say something like that? Because he was going to require of him a tremendous amount of faith. Okay? We're at the point now when he's 99 years old and he's been told several times now already that he's going to have a son. That that son, through that son, uh, he's going to have a descendant that's the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky and, and, and you know the whole story. At this point, he's 99 years old and no, no longer is he going, yeah, right. Now, at this point also, Sarah has had a confrontation with the Lord, too. And you remember when she was at the opening of the tent, and the angel of the Lord said, this time next year, your wife Sarah is going to be with child. And Sarah laughed, and she laughed because no faith. No faith. <laughs> she didn't have the faith for that. How old was Sarah then? 89? 90? Something like that? She was pretty old too. Yeah? I'd laugh too. Yeah. Any of us would laugh. But it was at that point that God got a hold of Sarah and changed her life too. Okay? Because a year later she was pregnant. Yeah, 99, uh, the Lord speaks to Abraham and he said, walk before me and be blameless. 
Now, to walk before the Lord is what? How would you describe that? Like an open book? Yeah? To walk before the Lord is to like walk like, an, like a, a wide open book for the Lord to read. I mean, nothing to hide. Absolutely nothing to hide. Here I am, Lord. Like the song we sang, you know, when you get that kind of an invitation to the Lord, He will press you. Uh, and he will squeeze you. He will see to it that there's nothing left to hide. Amen. He will bring about within you the character and the faith that you're going to need for the future. Amen? Amen. Walk before me and be blameless. Yeah. He's building in Abraham the faith necessary for the future. And of course, you know the rest of the story. At some point, that son comes along and when he's about 14 years old, Abraham takes him up to Mount Moriah yeah. to offer him as a sacrifice. How much faith did that require? Would that would that faith have happened without this? Uh -uh. No, it wouldn't happen. The Lord spoke to Abraham and said, walk before me openly, nothing to hide, walk before me blameless, and we will develop in you the faith necessary for life. Amen? Amen. So God, while developing this great man of faith, he says to him, walk before me and be blameless. And of course, to walk before the Lord is quite literally to be an open book. It's from this faith that springs forth the confidence in the Lord for anything. I go to Hebrews 11, verse 11. We're going to talk about Sarah just a little bit. I started rereading, when I was putting this together, I started rereading Hebrews chapter 11. Of course, that's what we call the faith chapter. Uh, and it was incredible to me how the Lord began to show me out of this chapter how, first of all, he developed character in these people. The character from which the faith sprang forth. It says, by faith, Abraham, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. I want to key on the word judged. You see, she had to spend time in front of God herself. Amen? What's that mean? By faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive. She bore a child past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. And that kind of judging can do nothing but change one's own character. To match the ultimate judge, God himself. To judge God's character is to judge your own. Amen? Yeah, if you're going to take a look at God's character, you can't help. Even, even Isaiah, ah, Isaiah went before the Lord and he said, I am just so totally undone, you know. Isaiah, being in front of God, was, was just so totally prostrate before the Lord because of, he, knew, he knew God's character so overcame his own. To judge God's character is to judge your own from which faith can be released to accomplish what is impossible for man. You know, so without, without quality character, without quality faith, nothing can happen. But when we develop in front of the Lord as an open book, anything can happen. Plenty more to read and understand that connection between character and faith in Hebrews chapter 11, the entirety of God's word. Actually, in uh, 11.23, let's take a look at, how am I doing on time? I don't have a watch in front of, oh, there's, there's a clock. Is that clock right? This I, oh, 11.15? Oh, we're in good shape. Oh, I got another hour left. <laughs> oh, we have to be out here by 12.30. Oh, we have to be out here by 12.30. Oh, well, we still got an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. 
11 23, Hebrews 11 23, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And look at this, listen to this, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Listen, how does a person come to that? Okay, so you understand the story here. Neb or, uh, the Pharaoh was, was killing all the babies, right? Killing them all, you know? And, and so here is the parents of Moses. Um, they're looking to have to do the same thing here. But they were not afraid of the king's command, and so they saved that child alive, put him in a basket, uh, you know how that works. You know, Pharaoh's daughter found him in the water, blah, blah, blah. How does that work? Unless they had spent time with the Lord as well. Yeah. Unless they understood very well the character of God and their own character matched that moment. They had faith to buck up against the Pharaoh's demands and they saved that baby alive. There's a lot of stories in Hebrews chapter 11. And they're all about faith. Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. When we read that, we typically read with faith in mind. But we need to reread that and understand the character that's being built behind that faith. What is going on behind the scenes that brings people to that point where they can make that kind of a decision? Listen, Pharaoh's a mighty, mighty big guy. he got lots of soldiers. There's lots of stuff out there that can hurt us, okay? Uh, yeah. By the way, the IRS right now is on the side of the cancel culture. Go figure. Yeah, guess what they can do to you? They can make your life miserable. Anyway, what am I going to Oh, don't do that. Or <laughs> tell me not. Shut up. <laughs> Glad her I have her as a referee out there. So, anyway. Okay. Now, since I'm not the technical guru that uh, your pastor is, I was not able to put applications on the board. You're going to have to write them down. Okay. Let's get into some of those applications. By the way, I love this about Pastor Eric. This is, this is why I think the book of Acts has been a fabulous series. And you know, talk about applications, okay? Well, I got some applications for you today as well. All right, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna imitate your Pastor Eric. Great guy. I like that, Pastor Eric. He, he's gonna watch this later. Okay, so. Application number one, you can write this down, it says, use this altar by faith. Use this altar here by faith. That's what uh, initiated this whole sermon, this altar right here. You've got to use this altar by faith. Okay, so how does that work? So I started this sermon today, a sermon talking about uh, Pastor Eric inviting us to the altar whenever we needed it. And now this altar is not some magical place here in the church building, but it is a place where you get to exercise your faith. And you might say, well, God can heal me or God can meet my needs right where I sit in the pew or the chair. Yeah, well, that's very true. He can do that. But when you leave that seat and you come down here to the altar, several things happen, okay? First of all, you're exercising your faith uh, by making that first move. When you make that first move, you can then expect God to answer. Okay? So when God sees your faith by coming down to this altar, and like I say, there's nothing magic, but you know, you can do it here at the altar, you can do it on that chair, it doesn't matter. But the issue is, is you're going to exercise your faith in front of God, which opens the door for Him to answer. Amen? Amen? Secondly, to get out of that chair and come to the altar is humbling, isn't it? And what's God think of humble people? He loves humble people. Yeah. Yeah. You can sit in the chair and you can go, well, I can sit here. God can heal me here. Or God can meet my needs here. Uh, I don't have to go down there. 
Yeah, God goes, yeah, I can do that, but I won't. Am I speaking to the Lord here? Anyway, no, that's kind of an issue. The third thing that happens when you get out of that chair and you come down here to this altar, hopefully this happens, is that you don't come along. That somebody will come alongside you and pray with you and pray in agreement with whatever's going on in your life. That itself is humbling. But it goes way beyond that. When we get to pray with each other, we develop a fellowship with each other. We, we develop a bond of love that just cannot ever be broken. It's a wonderful thing. Okay, that's why we are called the body of Christ. We all stick together like glue, don't we, Gary? Yes. Amen. Amen. That's what coming down here does. We all get to bond ourselves together in the love of Jesus. You know? I get to carry your burdens. You get to carry mine. Amen? Amen. Is that good stuff? Amen. Hallelujah. So, application number two. Character is formed from the Word of God. Why? Why is character formed from the Word of God? Because the Word is God. Amen? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Yeah, you get time in the Word, it can't help but have an effect on your life. The worst thing you can do is go out there, go out the door every morning, go to work without being in the Word. Amen. Yeah? I mean, it's just like shooting yourself in the foot. You know, you go to target practice and yeah, I'm going there, I'm going to shoot that target and blah, 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 and you get out to the target range and pull out your gun and shoot yourself right in the foot. <laughs> you know. Well, that wasn't very smart. Or get nothing going to work or going to work in the morning without being in the Word or at least having time of prayer. Pray with your wife, pray with your husband, pray with somebody. You know, get time alone with the Lord before you go off into that wicked world out there. And then you can go out the door saying, I refuse to be defiled. Amen? You'll be strengthened. Number three, we act in faith first, and God responds. And that's kind of the way it works all the way through Daniel. We see that pattern over and over and over again. Daniel chapter one, that's the way it's, 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 it's all about. Daniel gains favor uh, from Ashkenaz just because the Lord answered his first step of faith, and then God answered his second step of faith. Uh, with the testing. In chapter 2, Daniel chapter 2, it, Daniel goes on to uh, interpret a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that story? You never can have, yeah. yeah. And, and not only that, he saves all the other sages in Babylon at that time. Never, He was going to kill them all. And Daniel said, no. He said, I'll tell you what your dream was. And I'll tell you the interpretation. Not because I'm smart, but because God. Amen. Because God can do that. Amen. Yeah. So where was Daniel's faith? He wasn't in himself. It was in his God. Because he's at a point now where his character is so well formed that everything is about God. Everything's about trusting God. Everything is about God stepping up and doing, answering because of their faith. You know, God didn't come to uh, Daniel and say, Daniel, go talk to Nebuchadnezzar and tell him you got it. No. Daniel says, my God's got this. Yeah, let me go pray. We'll find out. And so he, yeah, Daniel and his buddies, they get together and they have a little prayer meeting and, and the Lord shares with the four guys, this is what I need you to do. Back to Nebuchadnezzar, there it goes again. I'm a, that's getting worse, isn't it? <laughs> Better change his name. That's ridiculous. Anyway, he goes back to Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and spills it all and, and, and then winds up saving all the other guys in Babylon. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous story. There's so much in there. Then he goes on in chapter 3. And of course, you know that one where Daniel winds up in the, in, the, in the lion's den. And by now, Daniel's faith is grown so resolute. 
Daniel's going to be thrown in the lion's den. Remember that story? The, fire, the furnace is fired up so bad and so hot that that when all four of them, they get when they get thrown into the lion's den, you know, even the guys that are throwing them in die. But they're in the lion's den, and there's four people in there, and Nebuchadnezzar says, oh, I just threw in three, and now I see four. Who's that? Well, the Lord's with them. Looks like the Son of God. Yeah. <coughs> But the issue before that is Daniel is so resolute in his faith that he he says, you know, you can throw me in the lion's den and God will deliver us from there. And then he says, but even if he doesn't, I'm still going to be resolute in my faith. Amen? Even if God doesn't answer, even if God doesn't step up and do what I, I hope that he does, I'm going to take the stand for the Lord. Now that's faith. Now that's faith born out of real character. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. And that's all I have to say about that. Amen. Amen. Um, let's see. Karen. It's me. Karen's going to come up and talk about the announcements. And uh, Mark's going to put them up on the board for us and do all that stuff. And thank you. Happy And just 